Well, good afternoon and welcome to all of you and welcome back to lots of you to the Blavatnik School of Government. I'm Nairi Woods and I'm Dean of the School. And a warm welcome to this, the third of our panels on Ukraine and the implications of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Today marks one month since Russia invaded. Some 3.1 million people have fled. The World Food Program is predicting a food and famine crisis in parts of the world. The implications that we're going to look at tonight are going to be focused primarily around the economic implications. Those of you who came to our previous panels will know that we've looked at the security implications, we've looked at the implications for the refugee regime for global order more broadly, um, as well as what's actually happening in Ukraine. In our last session, we were joined by one of our alumni who is still sitting in Ukraine, um, bravely trying to hold her organization, Teach for Ukraine, together, as our other um, alumni from Ukraine. Um, but tonight, we're going to focus on, and I say all that because we're not going to cover everything tonight. We, we try to get through a lot on these panels. But we're going to um, look tonight particularly at the ep economic implications, as I said. And I'm going to introduce each panelist just before they speak, so you can hold in your heads who you're, you're listening to. But let me promise you uh, four fantastic panelists, two joining us online this evening and two here on my left and right. But we're going to start with Beata Javorczyk. Beata, are you online already? Um, yes. Just checking she's online. Very good. Well, let me just introduce Beata Jaborczyk, who's actually a statutory professor here at Oxford University and a much um, valued colleague, currently um, on loan, as it were, secondment, as chief economist to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And, to, and part of Beata's current responsibilities include macroeconomic forecasting for the global economy. So to Beata, to kick off, um, a very simple question, Beata. You know, what are the economic implications for the global economy? Thank you, Neri. It's a pleasure to be joining you today, even though I wish we could be talking about happier topics. Um, so let me start by saying that the consequences of this war in terms of economics have already been felt not just in the countries involved in the conflict, not just in the region, but actually in many corners of the world. Moreover, if the war stopped today, I believe that we would be seeing the economic implications of the conflict also next year. So let me say a few words about the channels through which um, the war affects global economy. So the first channel is refugees. Um, Poland has so far has received 2 million refugees. Um, to put this into perspective, recall that Germany accepted 1.5 million Syrian refugees. And Germany is a country twice the size of Poland in terms of population. Um, if you compare the number of refugees to the labor force, it's about 10% of Polish labor force. Um, similarly for Moldova, uh, in, relative to the population size. So at the moment, municipalities in countries that have received refugees are dealing with um, unprecedented challenge. Of course, in the medium term, um, inflow of young, mostly um, often very educated people may be a bonus for countries that are uh, dealing with negative demographic trends and countries that are getting old before they are getting rich. Now, the second channel um, that I'm sure you are all aware of is the food prices. The price of wheat in inflation-adjusted terms is at the level we have last seen in 2008. In 2008, we had a bad harvest, uh, 
we also had a series of export restrictions imposed by countries on various agricultural commodities. And in this way, artificially shortages and price spikes were created. And back then, there, was, there were protests and riots in 40 countries around the globe. I worry um, that the situation may repeat itself and that countries concerned about food security will impose restrictions, which is going to lead to political instability, not to mention uh, poverty, inflation, and so on. The final channel I want to address is the channel working through high energy prices. Um, oil price is high, though it, is, it has not reached historical peaks. In contrast, the price of natural gas in Europe is reaching historical peaks. Um, that has implications for countries um, importing hydrocarbons. So for instance, imports of energy amount to about 10th of a GDP of Lebanon. It has implications for poverty. Um, prior um, to the pandemic, an average German household spent 7% of its income on utility bills. An average Romanian household spent a quarter of its income on utility bills. So high energy prices are going to hit harder uh, emerging markets than they are going to hit advanced economies, and they are going to hit harder poorer people in emerging markets. Now, high energy prices have also um, implications for green transition, for low carbon transition. So on the one hand, they may, on the one hand, they may provide an impetus for diversification of energy sources and therefore greater investment in renewables. On the other hand, record high prices of natural gas have uh, made coal relatively cheaper. So it may become more difficult to kick the coal addiction. Um, finally, let me just say about why I expect we will feel the consequences of this, uh, of the war into next year. Simply because at the moment, Ukrainian farmers are not sowing, are not planting as much as they no would normally do. And because countries such as Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, export vital inputs into fertilizer production. And because fertilizer production uses natural gas, prices of fertilizers are very high. That means that in many countries, farmers will be using less fertilizer, which again will have a negative impact on the harvest this year and may lead to higher food prices into next year. So let me stop here and we can later discuss further channels through which this crisis works. Thank you so much, Beata. And yes, so after we've come through the panel, we might want to come back to talk about inflation and what that might, you know, what your prognosis is around that. But let's move to the other panelists. Thank you so much, Beata, for a terrific start. Um, next, I have here on my right, Professor of Economic Policy here at the Blavatnik School, Stefan Durkon, also an advisor to the British government, the former chief economist in the Britain's then Department for International Development, and also an author of a couple of books that have real relevance to, to this, as well as many other things. But Stefan's book on dull disasters is about how we prepare for disasters and rebuild after them, and, I, and I'm particularly interested if we come back to Ukraine and think about the rubble that, that Russia has created in, in Ukraine, about the possibilities for rebuilding after, after it. And then Stefan has a forthcoming book in May that we'll be doing a session on, Gambling on Development, which is really about lessons for what works and what doesn't in that rebuilding. But I think there's some really vital stuff in there as well for the consequences of this crisis. So Stefan, over to you. Well, thank you. Um, Look, I, I want to make three points. I think one on Ukraine itself, and I'm two, two global points, um, and building actually on Beata on, in one of these points. So 
So I think the, the first thing is, is that, of course, we have very little data on the nature of the destruction of, of Ukraine, but it's, it's, of course, massive. But we shouldn't forget that Ukraine was a really poor country beforehand. You know, the GDP per capita of Ukraine is about 10% of the UK's. So we shouldn't forget that, that actually this is not your standard European country. This is actually a very poor country to start with. When war happens in countries, and in fact today we, I, was, uh, I was lucky to be on a call where uh, people from the School of Economics at Kiev University were talking from Kiev on, on, on what's happening. And they had a very nice, simple thing. You know, the way to think about the economy is like a taxonomy of three types. One is basically a war economy where actually the fighting is happening. Then there's a peripheral where everything is quite disrupted. And then there is finally actually a booming economy in the west of the country where all the people are coming to and they need to then, where it actually is all about, you know, there is, there is a boom. There's almost like an excess demand situation there. Meanwhile, supply lines from the coast are disrupted. So you get a whole supply chain kind of issue that is happening. Now, it's quite helpful to think about it because however this conflict pans out, I fear, you know, you know, we, we may all hope, and I'm sure uh, people in this room would have an outright victory of Ukraine, but most expectation is this will look like for a while like this. And actually then to think about, you know, how do you deal with that? So you have on the one hand, occupy territories that will be an economic wasteland. Sanctions will apply. You know, there is no real urge and probably from rebuilding on the Russian side. There is no real state that emerges. It's quite a mess. Then these other parts that are under Ukrainian control, and let's hope they're almost all of it, or if not into all of it, they will actually be quite difficult places. And we shouldn't forget that when we come to reconstruction, what we do now is going to matter of how reconstruction, how well it will work. We shouldn't forget that Ukraine, for example, on the on corruption index, was scoring really badly before the conflict. It was on in the uh, Transparent International put it as 122 out of 180 countries. The second worst country in Europe, the worst was Russia. Belarus was better, okay? And so you actually have to kind of really be concerned. This is not a country with strong institutions. I'm told, and I'm totally willing to take it, and since 2014 a lot has happened, but implementation hasn't quite happened. This comes almost too early to have strong institutions. So the first point is, is Let's think very carefully about reconstruction. This is not about massive amount of capital, just bring things in there, but find ways to lock this country in to maybe better institutions and progress. Maybe EU accession will actually be a great thing because it locks your institutions. But don't expect miracles. This is going to be really difficult, even in the best case scenario. Second, quickly, is that to actually some global, global consequences. So the first one is that actually, you know, and look, and I'm still sitting inside the UK government and quietly, and I know I'm saying this publicly now, I'm actually not just being very pleased that things like an economic crime bill in every country now, it comes to fruition. Suddenly the legal frameworks for actually dealing with illicit finance and illicitly acquired wealth are improving. At last, after many years, we have a register of beneficial ownership in, uh, that can help us to stop the London laundromat of actually washing, whitewashing money. This happens in other countries as well. A wonderful un unintended consequence would be there's going to be quite an opportunity in the world to actually become quite serious about this. Because every time we want to be firmer towards Russia, we'll need to have legal frameworks. We are countries with legal frameworks with institutions. We'll have to broaden them further. You know, little things like details that Abramovich yachts are now flying uh, the Bermudian flag. Now, what does the Bermudian flag look like? Ooh, there's a Union Jack in there as a little piece of it. This is uncomfortable truth that we need to bring out. So I would actually say, let's not actually take one positive here. There's actually, we may well go to a phase that we can attack much bigger issues globally than we actually ever been able to do on illicit finance. And I want to encourage everybody to keep that in mind because there needs a real push of intellectuals as well around that. Now, the final thing is briefly picking up Miyata's point. She made very eloquently a point on, on energy and on, and on, and on food prices. Uh, Ukraine, uh, together with Russia, is 30% of global exports of, 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 of wheat. Um, you know, planting is disrupted. I was told today on the call the expectation of the government of Ukraine would be a 30% less output. That's actually pretty good. 
planting is still going on. There's still things that are possible. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things we may be able to do it, and that maybe goes more for Q&A, of how we can support from here Ukrainian agriculture. There were some great ideas that I pick up, and I can definitely dwell on it further. But of course, there's a shock to the world. Let me actually say the very simple thing. Let us learn the lessons from 2008 and 2011. And the lessons are not that, well, famine will break out in the world because food supplies are stopping. The main impacts how it works through the economies in countries are crucial. It becomes an issue of how food prices work through the macroeconomy through fiscal and monetary policy. It may sound boring, but even in 2008, 2011, in the countries I'm interested in, developing countries in Africa, it was very different depending on the country you had it. And that's actually the important part. So it's not just the supply shock. It's how actually countries do it. We need to make sure that that can be done. Priyat is absolutely right. The biggest risk is the secondary impacts through the economy and then the political impacts, the political things there. Anyone who hopes for another Arab Spring, please let's not hope for that kind of things. But actually, it's the same kind of countries. Who is most at risk? The net importance of food and gas and oil, like, for example, the Ghanas, the Kenyas, the Malawis, the Egypts, the Tunisia, the Lebanons. That's where the biggest shocks will be. Let's also not forget Countries that I don't consider very well run will be having a great time now. The Nigerias of the world, the Malaysias, the DRCs, because they actually don't really have to do much to diversify economies. And they get lots of money coming in and the way it works through these economies as well. Let me stop there, but with simple, the one lesson from Beata's things when she said, it's the political consequences of these shocks we have to worry about. Not so much the global supply shock, but the way they work through the countries one by one. And it will look very different in different places. And that's what we keep, need to keep an eye on. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, thank you very much. Look, nobody better uh, than our next speaker to pick up where Stefan left off there on the consequences for different countries across the continent of Africa than Vera Songwe. Vera is joining us online. Vera is an economist who, has, who became head of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and has, in a pretty short time, almost single-handedly, although she won't like me saying that, transformed it um, and under the banner of ideas for a prosperous Africa, um, taking up the issues of trade, of competitiveness, of digital, um, of African women's leadership, among others, to really um, take and shake and improve uh, this important organization. Vera, thank you so much um, for joining us um, online this evening. Let me turn straight over to you for your introductory take on the consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be joining you um, today. At the, and, 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 and thanks uh, to the previous speakers uh, as well. And uh, really, um, my our thoughts, I think I, I can fairly say this, uh, go out to everybody um, that is in the middle of this conflict, in the midst of the conflict, uh, in both countries, by the way, um, and, and, and hopefully that we find some resolution to it. Let me start by saying yesterday, the, the Secretary General launched a global crisis response group to see how we could pull together all of the, 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 the international community to come to the different sort of strands of the response um, that we are now facing and, and talking about. There's many, um, I think, uh, issues that need to be handled and, and, and Africa in particular is coming from a space where, you know, we already had the COVID, then we had the economic crisis and we're talking about climate change. We've had a couple of uh, changes in governments and on the continent. We had the whole Sahel and, and you know, um, terrorism that has been hitting the continent. So, you know, first we talk about the double crisis, then the triple crisis, then the quadruple crisis, and that's just a tsunami, right? And, and I think I want to just start by saying it has been impressive that after all of this, you know, successive uh, hits on the continent, that we haven't seen the kind of you know massive crumbling uh, that that one would have started expecting uh, on, uh, uh, after COVID-19. We've seen on the continent uh, after COVID-19 the largest contraction in 25 years of sort of economic development on the continent. But the continent has come out standing still. We have we have three countries that applied for the IMF uh, G20 debt resolution process at the end 
uh, of 2021. So really those were the three countries that we could say were insolvent and had now gone from a need for liquidity into saying we need help, we need to restructure our debt. Then uh, we had this uh, new crisis that has just hit us. And it has hit us quite badly because it has come uh, for countries like Egypt, for example, where 70% of their wheat comes from Ukraine and Russia, but also they are an oil importer. So one of the, the, the conversations we've been having is 75% of the African economies now are low to middle income countries. The world is used to let's say, let's go solve the problem of the low income countries, but we can't just rush to the low income countries anymore. We need to rush to the middle income countries where most of the poor live, Nigeria, Egypt, South Africa, that have now been hit um, by this additional shock. It's not only oil prices that have gone up. It's also other commodities, other associated commodities. If you look like a country, uh, if you take a country like Nigeria, for example, where essentially Nigeria does export oil, but 70% of the parts for Nigeria's oil refinery come from Russia and Ukraine. So even though we may think at first bet that and Nigeria is going to be doing well, they may not necessarily be. So we're now working on all these heat maps to sort of get a better sense of, you know, really who is benefiting and who is not going to benefit. We've spoken about oil prices. I think one of the maybe positives I'd like to say about this is that as we got into this conversation, of course, the next COP is going to be uh, on the continent. We've all been talking about the just transition and what we should do with gas or should we or should we not use gas. I think we're now seeing gas as a security issue uh, uh, is how it's being defined in the West. And we've been saying, yes, for us, it's a security issue, it's a prosperity issue. And hopefully that conversation becomes more mature as we realize that we all need it and we need more of it. The other place, of course, where we see tensions is on fertilizers and we've spoken about it. So we have food first that is going up, but even if we decided to plant more, we have fertilizer costs that have just tripled. And, and so we're seeing you know, the knock-on effects for hunger uh, the, the the World Food Program is now talking about an additional of 100 million people that are going to uh, be at risk of falling into a hunger and malnutrition. We had 50 with COVID. So these numbers, again, are just continuing um, to rise. So we have food, we have uh, en energy, and of course, uh, uh, gas prices, which have been quite, quite uh, uh, high. Finally, what we are also seeing, and we did a map of where we go with the um, transportation and supply chain logistics. And this is, even if you had the resources, even if there was some wheat to be bought, it cannot get in. We are now seeing delays in supply chains of over six to seven months. And so even if one had those resources, there is the, it's very difficult to get them. We did a map of, of you know, flights over Russia and coming from the east into onto the continent, you know, that space uh, is now closed up, which means additional costs for even flights and, and, and movement across. Um, so what, what we are seeing is that compounded effect, uh, not just um, um, from food, from fuel and from gas, but also from the supply chain logistics, which were already hit by COVID. We're just beginning to take off again and are seeing a second hit. Of course, we, we, we've all talked about the need for better and more digitization, the use of it. I think what we're seeing that part of the world has also been the part of the world that has generated a lot of the resources on how one fights cyber criminality and how one understands it. So with the continent launching its uh, e-commerce and the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, where we needed to understand and stand up technology that will help us to do that faster, better, and more effectively, we're going to necessarily see a slowdown in those processes as we continue. So I think these are some of the big, in, in, in three, five minutes, big issues that we're, we're beginning to observe with um, this crisis, and we hope that um, we will find peace sooner rather than later. Thank you so much, Vera. Beata finished her comments by saying that the energy price consequences could either lead to countries uh, accelerating uh, their move to renewable energy or could increase the lure of coal. What do you think is going to happen? What do you see happening across the continent? You looked like it was the, it was the latter. <laughs> I think we will see the latter because the transition anyway needs resources. Uh, for our continent, the, I was going to say this, you know, we've seen our spreads go up because, you know, on the continent, when one country gets into 
a little bit of fatigue, then it feels like all of Africa is in trouble. So all of Africa's spreads go up. So it's going to be very difficult to get new investments into the continent. Already with COVID, we saw capital flight. So there was sort of a move to safety from FDI. Very difficult to get FDI back in this situation. Everybody sort of wants to hold a safe currency. Nobody's rushing to come and invest in gas. We are getting some investments in natural gas, but even before COVID and when we were having those conversations, it was about doing gas for Europe. So it wasn't about doing gas for the continent. So there may be some acceleration, but I think mostly what we will see, and we're already seeing it in Europe, by the way, is everybody delaying their plans for, for getting out of coal. And the biggest coal economy on, on the continent was South Africa, right? And so South Africa had already announced this was the biggest uh, uh, and the most positive COP announcement was essentially the $8 billion for South, South Africa to transition out of uh, coal. But out of that $8 billion, only about $30 million was concessional resources. Everything else was market. I've just said that, you know, rates have gone up. So, so it's going to become even more difficult for a country like South Africa. South Africa is selling coal. Coal prices have gone up by almost... Uh, $500 now coal, so, you know, South Africa should sell more and get quick resources. So I think there is going to be some tensions there with whether they divest quickly, whether we have some of the parts for the divesting that we're going to need because they're also coming from that part of the world. And so it may be quite difficult to see that happening quickly. And just one, one other just quick question, but you, you started your remarks tonight talking about the shocks that have already hit the continent of Africa with COVID and climate, et cetera. And if we go back further, the debt crisis in the 80s, the global financial crisis of 2008, is there anything that makes countries on the continent more resilient to this crisis? I think three things. Uh, uh, first, I don't know. I, I think we, 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 that we, there's some inbuilt mechanisms. And I must say that, you know, first of all, with the 2008 uh, uh, food, fuel, and financial crisis, we saw a lot more countries have safety nets being put in place. But we also saw a lot more countries taking seriously their food stocks. So food stocks, uh, and then you saw countries like uh, Rwanda, Guinea-Bissau, um, that went from being net food importers to net food exporters. So productivity did increase. Yes, we continue to say that the continent is still uh, the least, uh, uh, has the least productivity ratios on the agriculture side because of lack of use of fertilizer and technology, but they have increased substantially. So I think this shock is meeting us in a place where, one, we have increased productivity, but we've also diversified somewhat our food sources. And so that, and the African Free Trade Area Agreement has also allowed us to have more um, um, trade flows within the continent. And, and, and so you, and then countries like Ethiopia have substantially increased their wheat imports. So, so, so I think you can see we, the, the, the persistent shocks have actually helped the continent to build in, build sort of insurance and resilience mechanisms. And we're not nearly where we need to be. Only about 17 to 25% of the continent still has uh, safety net processes and policies in place. But I think already, you know, we're coming from 5% in 2008 when we had the first shock. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vera, um, for that starting comment. Let me now move to Dan Bayer on my left, who in the very short time it feels since Dan finished his doctorate here at Oxford University has packed in a lot. Sorry, it hasn't been that short of time. <laughs> Just yesterday, Dan. <laughs> Um, including being the ambassador for the United States under President Obama to the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Um, he's done a number of different things. He's now acting director of the Europe program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, Dan, really, you know, we've, we've been kind of on a little bit of a tour so far tonight. Um, really interested in the part of the world that you're sitting in, in the Americas, um, and how, how it's looking from, from there. Yeah, I mean, so many good pieces uh, of information and comments to, to dig into, and I th hope we'll turn quickly to Q&A from the audience as well. Um, but let me try to make six points that will come in a circle, um, if, I, if I can do it right. Um, the, first, the first is just, uh, it's important to underscore that all of these consequences that we're talking about are consequences of a war of choice. And that is incredibly tragic because, as several people have already highlighted, the world already faced enough problems that weren't uh, human controlled or chosen, even if they are human driven. And the fact that we're dealing with an added consequence uh, in this year is a real tragedy. And it's not just the direct implications of the war. Obviously, it's the, it's the geopolitical risk, which is going to cause 
more redundancies, more control for risk, which are inefficiencies, economically speaking, in our, in, in our economic system. You can go back and look at when the energy prices started to spike, resulted, I mean, my point about the risk, go back and look at when the energy prices started to spike. It was in December when the troops started to mass. It wasn't, it wasn't a month ago when the war started, when the actual renewal of, of this war started. It was when the risk spiked. And I think part of what we're reckoning with right now is the fact that Vladimir Putin has made clear that he will remain a geopolitical risk for the world for as long as he is in power. And that is going to be costly for the world for as long as he is in power. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two, I wouldn't be a good OSCE hand if I didn't um, make the point that, that others have made, which is that what we see here is a perfect example of how hard security, economics, and democracy and human rights are all connected and each feeds into each other. Russia's external aggression is connected to Russia's internal repression. The economic consequences uh, that we see not only in Ukraine but also in, in the neighborhood and indeed far afield will have consequences on the democracy, the democratic governance, the quality of governance, and that in turn will make for more instability that we will have to manage. This is a, this is a spiral that we have to intervene in, and they are all connected. Um, the third point on, on getting to the conflict itself, um, I'm part of the group, um, maybe unpopular or, or, or um, unconventional, that thinks that basically all of the talk about NATO uh, coming from Russia it's only a slight exaggeration to say that it was entirely a red herring. It was never really about NATO. And actually, it's much more about the EU and the EU's economic uh, promise for Ukraine. What, what Vladimir Putin couldn't accept was a prosperous democratic Ukraine. And the, the partnership with the EU is what actually offered that. And, and so I think, I think the EU is, is central in this as an economic actor both uh, in what the Ukrainians themselves want. I would, uh, a point I often make is that there's only one place that I know of in the world where people have died, been gunned down, carrying an EU flag, and that's on the Maidan in Kyiv. And, and that's what the Ukrainian people want. And yes, they've never had a government like the one that they deserve or want, but uh, that the EU is, is the key actor more than NATO here. On the, recon the third, uh, fourth point on reconstruction is, um, I think, it's really important to highlight what Stefan said. There will be an enormous opportunity um, to leapfrog in many cases because the infrastructure and, and, and um, the, the built infrastructure, both for transport, trade, uh, housing, uh, industry, et cetera, was not um, what Western Europe would consider modern. So there will be an opportunity to build back better, if I can borrow an American term. Um, but at the same time that we upgrade and we, it will be we, the international community, as at the same time we work to upgrade the hardware, we're going to have to also work to upgrade the software. And there will need to be forethought given not only to how to raise the resources to fund reconstruction, but also what kinds of political processes need to go alongside that to make sure that it is laying the groundwork for democratic governance, community-led um, reconstruction, et cetera. The fifth point is about shattered illusions. There's a lot of talk about people who have had their illusions shattered with respect to Vladimir Putin. And indeed, looking at my own country, every US president um, since Putin has been in office has come into office thinking that he can reset or recalibrate or find some modus vivendi with Putin. Every one of them has tried, and every one of them has failed. And um, you know, I think this, this war, once and for all, shatters the illusion that there's some modus vivendi that can be arranged with him. Obviously, we will have to live with him for as long as he's there. But he will be a threat to global security, and he will need to be treated as such for as long as he's there. The other shattered illusion, though, is one about geoeconomics, which is that most of us in the West have held to the idea in some form or another that we can have economic globalization without political globalization, and that capitalism, to put it crudely, will lead to democracy. This definitively shows that it isn't true. And even worse, not only does capitalism not lead to democracy, but allowing authoritarian states to free ride on the global uh, market economy that we underwrite means that they acquire resources and power, which they turn around and use against us and cause security risks. So it's a real reckoning that's going to happen. And I think it's going to lead not to mass, I mean, globalization can't be entirely reversed. But I think it's an open question how much the global economy is balkanized, and even good things, which I support, like the beneficial ownership law or going after illicit finance, those regulations are going to cause a kind of balkanization of the global economy, because what has been free-flowing will no longer be that way. 
Um, and so I think reckoning with what those consequences are um, is the fifth point. And the sixth point is, um, hopefully coming full circle, uh, um, the, the, coming back to where I started, which is that this is a war of choice. You know, obviously one of the consequences of this is that it sets us back on all of the other urgent priorities. And if there's one that we can single out, it is the climate crisis. The climate crisis is constantly in a battle of the urgent against the important. It is always the important and never the urgent. And so COVID delayed uh, climate action, even if COVID, because of the economic contraction, net net was beneficial for, for the climate crisis. Who knows how this one is going, this crisis is going to turn out net net at the end of two years or, or, or five years, but it will delay attention being given to what needs to be a global coordination and so will the economic fragmentation undermine some of what needs to be uh, done in terms of global coordination to combat the climate crisis. And so I think recognizing that this war is undermining our ability to cooperate as a globe, as a global community, on a number of urgent priorities, um, it's another cost that Vladimir Putin has imposed on us. Thank you hugely, Dan. Um, I'd like to come to your questions to panelists, and if you're online, please feel free to send a question in on the Q&A. There's a couple of things that I'll pick up um, before we move to those. And a first to you, Stefan, um, and perhaps Beata um, will have some thoughts on this. Organizations across the world, individuals and organizations, are contributing millions and millions to the kind of refugees cause. And I, I was on a call with a couple of charities that work on this issue yesterday, and they were talking about, you know, the, the, the huge risks attached to millions and millions now um, that need spending now when there's actually not effective ways to spend it now, and the certain knowledge that we have that in three years' time, when Ukraine desperately needs money to rebuild, it won't be there. So is there a solution to that problem, um, Stefan? Um, well, the, the diagnosis is very correct. What we know about any protracted crisis in the world is that we have this terrible kind of declining curve where the first year there is this massive amounts of money that's going and then the crisis doesn't really change but then the money starts going down. Um, so, the, so, so first of all the kind of and especially when it comes down say from humanitarian support channels. So, so the first thing I would say is that the financing model we use for that is actually very flawed. Um, when there's a humanitarian crisis the way humanitarian uh, financing happens globally in the world is that there's no humanitarian organization like within the UN system or in, uh, based in Geneva or whatever is allowed to have an overdraft ever. Uh, it only has to have cash and then it needs to spend. So it needs to do it always with begging bowls. And of course, begging bowls only work for a while because after a while everybody gets tired. So governments politically don't need to then spend anymore. So you need to go for alternative ways of financing humanitarian crisis. And then it comes probably to things like you know, Ukraine is a lower middle income country. It means it has access to certain resources within the international system. Because it's at war, it probably gets blocked. We need to find ways of unlocking it. This could be very long term loans that maybe in five years time we then cancel. But you know, you, you use basically uh, organizations like the World Bank uh, much more for these kind of purposes than we do at the moment. Humanitarian crises are not financed really by the World Bank because that's development finance. So the siloization of this whole system is not, not working very well. So you need to just basically start planning now uh, for this. There is a related thing there, you know, it is actually not to rush too quickly in terms of committing the vast resources for the rebuilding. There is a, there's a real Dutch disease problem, sorry, that actually means somehow a relative price shock would happen if we want to rebuild something very quickly. We know from after a crisis, after post-conflict, cement prices go through the roof. So you kind of want to start planning this much more carefully in, in, in terms of how, how you, how you uh, pay for that. And uh, you, you want to actually do this. One thing I, I think, and it comes back to your point, Dan, is that it is so crucial uh, that actually early on we start thinking of that soft infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because why do, do reconstructions and post-war conflict situations often are so costly? Mm 
because actually, to be frank, a lot of money gets wasted. Things are not really procured well. It's the cavalry from the United Nations need to come in. They don't know these countries well. You want to be able to work with local institutions and so on. So you begin to now to plan for rebuilding with the soft infrastructure. There's a really interesting thing, I, and, and a final point on this, Nairi, is I find it really worked in development for a long time and also in post-conflict, and everybody talks about Marshall plans. And I always hate it when they do it. But actually, funnily enough, there are good lessons now of Marshall Plan this time. This is the, probably the first time in my career there's a real lesson. Marshall Plan came down to about 3% of the GNI, of the GDP of the recipient countries. That's a small amount of money. That would mean 5 billion in the context of Ukraine relative to a GDP. But it came with a promise of what you were talking about, of modernizing your institutions, a dream, a, perspe a perspective. So that's what the EU could do now, actually begin to talk about what their Marshall Plan would be, which would include both the soft infrastructure and then saying, and look, as part of it, we will then help you to rebuild this whole thing, and you plan that now. Mm. Could I come to Beata um, with a slightly different question? Um, feel free to pick up anything Stefan said, but with a different question. So a couple of our um, audience online are asking about the impact of sanctions on Russia, and there's a couple of angles to this. But, but can I first ask you, it's easy for us to forget what's happening actually to Russia, and of course, there are lots of people in Russia who are appalled by this war, but who are now sitting in an economy which itself is going to presumably get plunged into um, some kind of ruin. And I know that your organization, Beata, works with Russia. So what's, what's the thinking about that? What does a post-Putin Russia recovery plan look like? At the very least, for European security reasons, because having a country the size of Russia with a nuclear arsenal on, in, in the north of Europe, you know, we, a, a political and economic implosion in Russia will, so, will surely, as, as Dan said, continue to pose a great threat. But is there any thinking already going on about what to do with Russia? Um, thank you, Nairi. So perhaps I should start with the previous questions um, with refugees. I am somewhat optimistic about um, so how refugees could be integrated into the economies of the recipient countries uh, for several reasons. First of all, they have been granted the right to work in the European Union. Um, there is cultural linguistic similarity. Um, for and there, there are already Ukrainians in the region. So for instance, Poland had already 1.5 million Ukrainians prior to the war. Um, so they are bound to help their compatriots who are arriving now as refugees to get integrated into the economy. Central Europe had red hot labor markets in the summer. These labor markets cooled down, but they can absorb a chunk of people. Um, so I am quite optimistic, though obviously the most optimistic scenario would be for the war to end very soon and uh, for people being able to return. On reconstruction, I think the key to a successful reconstruction is limiting uncertainty. Right? Because obviously donors, MDBs cannot do all the work. You need private investment. And if uncertainty about the status of the country, about politics, about external relations persists, that's going to be detrimental to investment. Um, also, I very much agree with uh, Stefan, that we need to upgrade institutions, and that's where you need this external anchor. You need to create an incentive to progress with reforms. And Stefan rightly pointed out that you know Ukraine had trouble with improving institutions. A lot has been done, but you know prior to the conflict, its institutions were not at this satisfactory uh, level. On Russia and sanctions, um, if you think about sanctions in 2014, they cost Russia 
about 1% of GDP. So they back then they did not hurt very much. Um, Russia has been building up its uh, macroeconomic stability. Um, you know, Russian budget, government budget is balanced when oil price is at $44 a barrel. Now it's above 100, so public finances are balanced. Um, Russia was reacting very quickly to surges in inflation um, during this early fall, the summer. Um, so yes, there will be uh, a recession, but you know the true impact of current sanctions is going to be long term. And it's going to materialize through lower flows of FDI, which primarily bring knowledge. It's the knowledge, it's the managerial skills, it's the technology that are important for growth. It's sanctions are going to hurt through restrictions on exports of technology. And also the current situation will give many Russians an incentive to leave their country. And you know, there is often positive selection when it comes to outward migration. It's the entrepreneurial, it's the educated people who leave, and that's going to hurt long-term growth of Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beata. So a question to all panelists, depending on which one of you uh, feels uh, you can answer it. So from Brody M. Um, says there's a lot of discussion at the NATO summit today about weaning the EU and Germany in particular off Russian liquid uh, LNG. But Germany doesn't have any LNG terminals. Can any of the guests speak to whether Germany can realistically use excess capacity in LNG terminals in other parts of the Eurozone to import more from Qatar or from the US? And Richard Eakins asked about the EU cutting its oil and gas purchases from Russia. Um, any thoughts on, on this? Feel free to say no, and, or we can crowdsource it from the room. Do we have uh, a gas and energy expert in the room? Vera, thank you. Yeah. Put it as somebody in the room. I, I think three things have happened with that. Um, one, we've seen um, you know, Iran and uh, Venezuela are back in the markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, Algeria, I also uh, suggested. So, but but we've seen uh, OPEC has refused to to sort of you know give us more more energy supplies, and so I think again on this conversation around energy security and what we're willing to do and not willing to do, we've seen that we're willing to re-engage in all conversations and maybe um, as we we create a. Uh, 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 conflict in one part of the world, this may help us advance uh, much faster in the conversations around Iraq and uh, uh, Iran and, and Venezuela, where we have kind of left them alone. And, and I, I, many of us will remember the surge of refugees, right, from Venezuela when we got uh, uh, some of the sanctions put then on them. I think refocusing, because as uh, Stefan was saying, we tend to forget people after a while. I think we had tended to forget a little bit the Venezuelans, and now, you know, they're back in the news. And, and hopefully some more focus will, 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 will get to that. And, and this is, Elizabeth, again, the conversation around politics, economics, and peace and development and how we bring all of that together. And, and, and my sense is, as we look at Iran and as we look at the Venezuela, the, the suggestion should be different. Can Germany get uh, a gas from, from other places? I think we saw already the French coming to Algeria, and there's a pipeline that goes that's from Nigeria, actually. And then, you know, it was a, a part of the African infrastructure development project. I think there is going to be more talk about, uh, around that conversation. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but clearly there are alternative routes for LNG uh, development. There is Mozambique, of course, where a lot of work had already started but stopped. Uh, and, and my sense is that a lot of that is going to, to take off again. So, so yes, there is gas supplies. I think the conversation is whether we want that much more new production of gas or not. I think on the continent, we will say yes. Uh, I think there is still some conversations in Europe about whether uh, that will be the right thing to do or whether we should, Im I think part of the conversation in Europe is should we fast track uh, investments into hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, should we fast track investments into electronic batteries and, and that maybe that will take us faster into a sustainable and cleaner environment than sort of doing more gas. Thank you very much, Vera. So let me now turn to the room for any questions that folks have in the room.
to our brilliant panellists this evening. Yeah. Yes, do introduce yourself. Oh, hi, um, my name is Takanori Higuchi. I'm a banker in Japan. And I'd like to ask about the impact on the US middle class and collateralized loan obligation. Um, there is a serious discussion in the financial community now about the concern um, that the extreme inflation that you've mentioned um, will be accelerated by the war and um, prompting central banks um, all over the world to raise interest rates, uh, which results uh, resulting in the collapse of um, loan-dependent countries, especially the U.S. So um, is there a possibility that this case would be the return of the great financial crisis? Um, great, great question. Um, how likely a financial crisis um, in the next um, you know, short to medium term provoked by this. Any panelists up for that one? Dan, you look ready to leap. Uh, yeah, oh, go ahead. Vera, did you want to go ahead? I, I guess uh, I'm, I would be skeptical about, I mean, I guess I feel like one of the things that we saw in the last um, few years is that there were some lessons learned from 2008. Um, and indeed part of why we are seeing inflation right now um, is because we, the lesson that was taken from 2008 is that it's better to go big and overshoot than to go small and have an ex extremely long, extremely painful uh, recovery. And I guess I, I think that, that um, the recent experience with bold moves probably augurs well for more bold moves. Part of, I mean, it must be incredibly hard to be a central banker right now because you've got several different things sloshing around. We haven't talked at all about China, and China connects also to the LNG market. I mean, America is selling LNG to China, and China needs that LNG in order to get their factories back online. And if they hadn't held on to zero COVID for so long, they would need the, even more uh, LNG to get their factories back, back online because part of the reason that they have lower needs right now is because they're shutting down uh, parts of the country again. So, I mean, this is a global market with global repercussions. But I, I, I mean, I guess I, I certainly hope that we're not headed for another financial crisis. And I do think that there have been lessons learned in the last decade, by both in the last two years in the response to COVID, as well as um, certainly in two, 2008. And I think central bankers will be very attentive to those lessons. But I guess uh, the question that that poses uh, for Vera and Beata is that central banks exhausted their ability to do big moves, and they've exhausted it over the last decade. You know, what is left in the war chest for central banks to make a move? And then COVID, some would say, has exhausted the kind of fiscal moves that governments can make, the, the way that governments can open their own coffers to spend. So what's in the toolkit to deal with a, a crisis in the offing this time round? I think two things. The first one is that those crises, the previous crises, is actually emanated from the from the from the financial sector. It's a very fundamental difference, right? And and it was in some sense speculation, maybe under over regulation, whatever whatever the case may be. So you had stress in the middle of the financial system itself. This one is more coming from the real sector, and so there is a difference there already. The second thing that uh, I'll say, and I'm stopping here. Uh, to give better a chance is also that we have the SDRs. We we, we have a, a tool uh, that we can use. I know there was a lot of discussion yesterday, Dan, about whether we should issue new SDRs or not and who will benefit. Of course, if you issue new SDRs, Russia gets some, uh, but I'm sure there is ways around that as well. So I think we have, we still have some uh, 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 tools in our toolkit that we could use. We, could, we don't need, necessarily need to do tapering as fast as we're doing. Uh, uh, I think some of the inflation, we've already seen some containment of that. So there's still, I think, a few things that can be done. Thank you, Vera. Beata. Yes, so are we going to have a financial crisis? I hope not. If you um, look at Europe, at exposure of, for instance, of European banks uh, to Russia, Austrian banks, their claims on Russia are at the order of 1% of Austrian GDP. Uh, in UK and Italy, it's about half of a percent. So it's costly, but manageable if you look at the banking sector. Um, what I am worried more about is an environment with higher interest rates because disruptions to supply chains are not going away. Um, You've mentioned zero COVID policy in China, parts of China in lockdown, which causes further disruption. In the US, 
West Coast ports are going to be renegotiating their labor contracts with the union, which means uh, that um, possibility of strikes and so bottlenecks, slower uh, acceptance of slower channeling of goods via these ports. And all of this is going to contribute to inflation, higher food prices next year, you know, if Europe is unable to replenish supplies of natural gas. And remember, we entered this winter with much lower uh, fill of capacity of storage than what we saw in the last 10 decade, last decade. And, you know, it's not obvious that Europe will be able to fill its storage tanks. So we are in for another winter with high natural gas prices. So inflation will be there. It will force central banks to react with increasing interest rates. Um, and that is going to make investments in um, advanced economies more attractive than investments in emerging markets. And in a high interest rate environment, investors tend to be more discerning. They tend to uh, demand higher compensation for political risk. You know, when I was talking to our board about projections um, and economic situation in countries where the EBRD operates, during the COVID, I kept on saying, well, look, most of our countries of operations were able to borrow during COVID more cheaply than five years or 10 years before. In between 1st of February and, you know, March 3rd, that has changed. And that will mean harder borrowing, more costly borrowing, and higher cost of debt servicing. So I think I worry more about debt crisis, particularly among the poorest countries, than a financial crisis. And Stefan, I'd like to, to follow up on that. And, and thank you, Riata, for, for, for where you ended with that. Because, you know, the, the, so the question, of course, for, for say, you as economy, they can be in control of their tapering. They can actually manage it. And I think, I totally agree with Dan, they've learned an awful lot from 2008, and they actually will probably slow down a bit at that tapering and so on. OECD countries in general, they have some freedoms. The ECB is, of course, quite restricted in what it does, but it can do these things. But it basically, in some ways, they're going to export the problems to countries that can't quite do this. And that's actually, with, you know, by creating inflation in the world, you'll get certain the countries where then the inflation comes in. Now, they don't really have a toolkit. Their fiscal situation, as we had just implied, with their debt situation is already getting quite high. Their temptation will be, and then the polit politics comes into it, to protect certain groups that are important for their politics. That means they pass on the risk to other groups. And in some countries, that will be the urban people or the civil servants may be protected and other ones will suffer. In other places, it will be the farmers that will be protected and not. And so you keep on getting passing on. But then you create that basically, both of all, a much more uncertain environment. And as Beata said, you know, investors will run to a bit more certainty and OECD will be certain. At the same time, you actually really start creating a lot of problems. And it's, it's, it's also what I probably earlier wanted to allude to is the way countries fiscally and monetary will work through this will really determine they, but they, 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 how it will end. But it's actually uncertain what the best way is for their own stability. And so the best we can hope for in the same terms of response is saying, well, during COVID, so many countries have learned to actually do forms of social protection. Mm. Uh, even Ukraine actually has now systems that they could reach by mobile phones, the firms and the individuals. But actually all over the world, we have that. So we could hope that they can do it. But it's such a risk now in the way these things will be passed on. Mm. So I don't worry about the middle classes in the US, to be honest. I worry about what will happen to poorer groups in lots of societies. Brilliant. Look, I'm very aware that we are out of time. I'm also very aware that this is a topic which is heartbreaking for everybody in this room, but much, much worse for people still sitting in basements um, if they're still alive across parts of Ukraine. And we've heard some sobering messages tonight about the impact and implications for people fleeing Ukraine, for energy and food prices, the possibility of a debt crisis in some of the poorest countries of the world, the disruptions to supply chains, but also the effects of inflation on, in fuel and food on 
people in our own, in this country that we're sitting in tonight, in your country, Dan, in other parts of, of Europe. But we have also heard some less grim implications of this crisis or some possibilities um, to do better as we come out of this crisis. And I do just want to underscore those before we end tonight. The, the underscoring of the benefits of resilience, that some of the resilience that was built during COVID can be seen now, that some of the resilience that Vera Songwe talked about that's been built in countries across Africa is now being underscored as incredibly important and useful. That as Beata reminded us, that refugees have an extraordinary record in countries of building and, and, build and being engines of growth without taking anything away from their extraordinary human contribution in countries. And that many of the countries to which refugees are flowing are countries which have a demographic deficit that need those skills, the energy, and the youth of the refugees that are coming into them. That, as Stefan pointed out, we're seeing legislation now hurried through against economic crimes, against corruption, against the proceeds of corruption, which is so debilitating for the people that lose out when their countries are looted and when London, Delaware, or wherever you might fancy permits that kind of endless laundering. And we're seeing a system tighten up against that across the world. That in Ukraine, we're not, we're not going to be engaged for the first time in trying to help a country reconstruct. Syria is also right there. And there are, there are a couple of decades, sadly, of lessons on how to do that. That there is a chance for the world to come together to do it better this time. And that on the energy issue, yes, there is an immediate lure of coal because of the security implications, the, the relative cheapness given the hike in, in energy prices. But this could also be a moment because of what's happening in energy for it to be a leapfrog towards renewables. Because let's not forget, as somebody said in an earlier panel, once you've bought solar panels and attached them, you don't have to rely on ongoing flows of oil or gas from countries that you're trying to sanction. That this could be a wake up call for renewable sectors that do give countries more energy security at the same time. So with that, can I ask you to join me in thanking our fantastic panelists this evening, Beata Javorczyk, Vera Songwe online, Stefan Dokon, and Dan Bayer here with us. We're so grateful to each of you, not just for the time that you've given us during this panel, but for the time you spent distilling those fantastic introductory comments um, and, and informing all of us. So please join me in thanking our panelists this evening. And thank you to all of you and 